I can, I can, okay, I see some participants here. Uh, Jenny, Jenny, how are you? Yeah. Francesca, uh, I see the, the, the sun has risen wherever you are. <laughs> Mona Khalil, how are you? Renata, Thanks. good to see you. So we're, we're, we're waiting on Laura Holgate. But, but, why, but, why, but why, don't, why don't we begin? I wanted to welcome all of you today to, to, this, to this seminar, which uh, is being held by Atomic Reporters in the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Uh, obviously, you know why it's being held under these circumstances and why I'm talking to you with a mask on my, on my face. Um, but I, I, I'm leaving everything in the hands of Francesca, uh, who, who, who uh, I, we were speaking to earlier today, um, and who is being a, a stalwart in, 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 in participating in this, in this panel, even, 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 even at six o'clock her time in the morning, she was, she was, <laughs> yeah, on call and, and, and yeah. So, uh, thank you, Francesca. And let's, 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 let's let uh, uh, Laura in when she arrives. But in the meantime, uh, please go ahead. And thank you very much for all your help. Well, thank you, Peter. And, uh, Welcome everyone, but particularly I want to send a big virtual hug to my panelists, Renata, Jenny, Mona, and as soon as uh, Laura uh, joins, Laura as well. And I am really thrilled to just be the moderator of this panel discussion. I am not an expert on this, uh, on the issue of gender and international security and the women role in particular. So I, I have much to learn from uh, these panelists who have thought uh, very much about these issues and they've been themselves the promoters of uh, more women participation in the respective field. So if you read the description of uh, uh, the panel discussion, one of the key questions is are women playing a greater role in international security uh, issues today? And if that's the case, what are the drivers? So. Uh, my sense in setting up this panel is to discuss a little bit the challenges that women face in international security, but also talk about the leadership role that you all have played in launching initiatives in fostering new opportunities for women in this field. So I want to avoid the trap of having a panel that just complain about uh, women issues. I think there is much to celebrate uh, and there is also much to, to be done yet. Uh, so I want, I want to start with thinking about the challenges, but later on, I also want to ask about the, some of the initiatives that inspire you and think they are very promising in this field. So let me begin uh, just by introducing uh, each of you, and then uh, I don't want to introduce the whole panel all together, but just uh, I, I give the floor to uh, one speaker at a time. And I want to start with you, you Renata. Uh, so you have uh, the, the, the attendees have your bio. I just want to mention that you are a researcher at UNIDIR. And if you allow me, I think you are one of the most influential voices when it comes to thinking about issues related to women um, in security, particularly in the academic fields, and you have done much with your research. One important research is this missing link argument that you put forth. I have a question for you precisely about one of your, of your article. In 2019, you author a report entitled Still Behind the Curve, Gender Balance in Arms Control, Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Diplomacy. So can you give us a sense of uh, why we're still behind the curve? What do we have to catch up to? What are some of the targets that you think we should aspire to? Sure. <clears throat> thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, thank you very much, Atomic Reporters and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, colleagues for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be joining you remotely. Uh, I have this background because today actually it's quite dark here in Geneva, so I wanted to pretend it's a bit of a sunnier day. 
Um, yes, yeah, so Francesca, uh, I work at Unidir, uh, where I lead the Gender and Disarmament Program. This program was established here in 2018. Before that, Unidir had some sporadic research on um, gender. Let's say whenever the funding allowed, you know, it wasn't really a priority for the Institute. Starting in 2018, it became a dedicated program with a dedicated staff, with dedicated goals, resources. And I think this is very important to mention because I see um, many uh, organizations may think this is important, but they don't allocate the resources, the time and make this a priority. And, and it's hard to advance this agenda as a research agenda if you don't have um, the resources and the structure to do so. So at UNIDIR, we've been exploring gender dimensions of arms control and disarmament in a very systematic way since 2018. And we cover all types of uh, weapons processes. So we look at whatever may be specific linkages between um, gender norms and the way a certain weapons system work or the impacts or um, the way women and men have engaged with those topics before. So we try to come up with very specific uh, data and knowledge and insights and ideas on how to make the field of arms control and disarmament more equal. Um, so what we have seen recently, as you said, there have been a push, a momentum for bringing more conversations about women's participation and, and gender diversity in arms control and disarmament. And let's say at least since 2018, when the Secretary General of the UN launched his disarmament agenda, he included there two specific goals about gender parity in arms control and disarmament. Before that, we would have, let's say, broader frameworks like the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, but they talk about international security as a whole and sometimes disarmament feels, arms control and disarmament feels a bit like a separate uh, portfolio. So with the disarmament agenda of the Secretary General, we have a normative basis to bring actually uh, gender considerations into arms control and disarmament specifically. And the Secretary General committed to achieving gender parity in his uh, work. And he mentioned the importance of the full and equal participation of women. And since then, we have uh, listening, we've been hearing many countries say they support and they are working towards uh, increased participation of women. But we actually didn't know what, what does the women's participation look like. And that's why we did that study, the Still Behind the Curve study. The objective was to provide a baseline assessment to understand where we are now and how will we know when we achieve progress, right? How can we monitor progress? So for that research project, we look at lists of participants um, over four decades, over 80 multilateral meetings covering arms control and disarmament issues, uh, be it conventional weapons, be it nuclear weapons, we found very similar patterns in those uh, in that research. And I can share with you the main findings. Um, this publication is available in our website. Uh, but I can tell you that what we found is that to nowadays, in arms control and disarmament meetings, women are usually represented at the level of 30% in meetings with more than 100 participants. So let's say large meetings. If the meetings are smaller, if the meetings are less than 100 participants, the level of women's participation tend to drop to 20%. So there is a correlation between group size and gender in the sense that if countries can only send one participant to a meeting covering arms control and disarmament, they will most likely send a man and women will be included, let's say, as the second or the third or even the fourth member of the delegation, which leads us to an, another issue that we found is that the problem is more pronounced at leadership. So uh, whoever gets to send, who send out in one person delegation or in a GGE, in a group of governmental experts or in a working group or in is more technical, uh, smaller size meetings, is usually someone who is at the higher hierarchy or he's, who is perceived as an expert. And there are gendered aspects in both, uh, in both ways. What we have seen is that um, 
men tend to be overrepresented in uh, heads of delegations, even to a greater degree than you would expect um, as a, as a, at the overall level of participation. I can say, for instance, um, in 2018, the forums that we look, we look at first committee of General Assembly, of Conference on Disarmament, of the NPT uh, meetings, 76% um, of heads of delegations were men and 66% of delegates overall were men. So men were overrepresented as heads of delegations and women were underrepresented. Women as heads of delegations were 24 and women overall as diplomats was, were 34. And this pattern of men being overrepresented and women underrepresented as heads of delegations, this hasn't changed over the past four decades. What has changed is that we have seen an increased participation of women. In the 80s, women as diplomats attending this type of, of conversation were less than 10%. And nowadays we are at the level of 30%. So as you said, uh, there we've come a long way in a relatively short time. But if you compare the field of arms control and disarmament with other fields of po foreign policy, let's say human rights, uh, social affairs, or even I think climate also, they tend to attract more women uh, than the field of arms control and disarmament. So to put these numbers in context, we actually organized focus group discussions with diplomats and we presented them with these numbers. We said, you know, numbers don't tell the whole story. We want to hear from you. What's the story here? <laughs> well, how, how do you, and we actually had a conversation in, in New York, Geneva and Vienna with diplomats covering arms control and disarmament and with men and women. We tried to have 50-50 in this conversation because a lot of the times, in my view at least, when we are talking about women's participation, it's, it can't be a conversation only about women, for women, by women, because it's, it's in relation. We live in a, in a relational world, right? So we actually have to understand what, uh, the other side as well. So we had those conversations and there were some key themes that emerged from that conversation and that also is presented in our report. Um, the qualitative aspect of our research showed that um, there is some, some sort of um, attributes of the field of arms control and disarmament that have been characterized as masculinities and masculinized norms, and the field tends to reward characteristics associated with men, let's say risk-taking, toughness, military experience, and it's harder for women to be perceived as a, a good policy act, as a, 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 an expert policy actor, as a, a good policy maker in this field. So this was one topic that came up, um, the attributes associated with the field and the institutional culture of the field. Another topic that came up was also about um, work-life balance, uh, how the field of diplomacy as a whole is difficult to maintain work-life balance. And this is a problem for everyone, women and men. But as we know, women tend to shoulder the larger part of care work at home. So this can also hold them, help them back in their career or they themselves may say, actually, I don't want to take a lengthy assignment outside my home. I don't want to do this. It's complicated. Let's say the NPT review conference, it runs for four weeks. So it means that people need to leave their house and go to New York for four weeks. So, so it also led us to think about maybe rethinking the practice of diplomacy to make it more adjusted to, to family life. And um, the third and final point, I'll stop here. Uh, it's about the importance of gender equality. Not everyone agrees. I mean, people have varying views. We see the UN is always pushing for gender equality and saying gender equality is a prerequisite for progress on any front. But people, individuals and countries also have different positions on this. A lot of people, they actually want, want us to convince them that it's important. They want, they come to UNIDIR and they say, oh, can you do some research showing the impact of women? If, if we get more women, do we get a better outcome? So we still, seem to have to justify women's presence. We still have to come up with good arguments. We still need to come up with good arguments to, to uh, bring, bring more women into this, this conversation. Fantastic, great framing. Thank you so much, Renata. I want to move then uh, 
to connect exactly what you said, right? The, the situation of women in arms control with the broader framework of women in peace and security. And I can't think of a better person to speak about this, this broad, broad uh, issue um, than Mona Khalil, who, who is very difficult to summarize her bio in three seconds. She has over 25 years of experience in international law. She has served in many, many different legal affairs offices uh, across the United Nations, International Atomic Energy Agency. I also want to mention, uh, Mona, that you were the legal advisor to the UN Secretary General Special Advisor on post-Saddam Iraq. Uh, so you have a, an incredible knowledge of women issues in conflict, in post-conflict, in the reconstruction phase. Um, and of course, everything started with the resolution uh, 1325 with UN Security Council recognizing that there has to be a legal framework for, for women in peace and security. So I want to ask, uh, where do we stand uh, with this big issue of women in peace and security? And if you can give us also your view of how well the UN has done uh, in implementing this push for really gender equality. Thank you, Francesca. It's an honor to be part of such a distinguished and important panel. And I want to thank Peter for inviting me to join the event from the start. Um, indeed, uh, October 2020 marked the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325. So I can uh, assure you that plenty of uh, studies, plenty of reports, plenty of uh, promotional activities and events were organized to precisely, as you just said, assess the progress and, uh, and measure whether, in fact, progress had been made. And I have to be honest with you, although we're looking to be a little bit more positive and more optimistic, there's really not much to celebrate. Um, despite 20 years of effort, despite this very stern warning uh, on the occasion of the 15th anniversary in 2015, that immediate and urgent measures needed to be taken if we're going to meet the goals, there, there does seem to be a clear lapse. There's no question of of rhetoric, there's no question of uh, presumed commitment, um, but the implementation and the realization of those stated goals and stated values seems to be rather, rather lacking. Uh, so what, what exactly did Security Council Resolution 1325 demand or envision, and it is indeed the foundational resolution of the uh, role of women in peace and security, and it fundamentally calls for a full, equal, and meaningful participation of women in decision-making, peace processes, and governance. So we can even begin to measure whether it's full and meaningful. Um, uh, the first starting point is, uh, is whether it's equal. And, uh, and this is probably the most uh, disappointing, even disturbing uh, part of the story. So despite a very concerted effort by successive secretary generals and uh, clear, uh, appeals to the membership and to the various uh, parts of the system, uh, we still have less than 20% of the peacekeepers are women. And this is despite the fact that we know that it's not just a matter of reporting statistics, but in fact, the ability to carry out the mandate, uh, whether it's the protection of civilians mandate or the human rights mandate or the uh, capacity building mandate or to help national capacity to actually meet their own gender parity and, and women's empowerment goals, um, we are not setting a good example. We have less than three of the peacekeeping missions led by, by women. Uh, sorry, less than one fifth, so that's three out of 15. Um, and we have a, a very, very uh, glacially growing number percentage of, of female peacekeepers, in, uh, whether it's the military or the police. Uh, clearly, uh, conflict areas involve gender-based violence, including rape as a weapon of war, including uh, other gender-based uh, uh, socioeconomic impacts um, that, uh, that the system itself has recognized would benefit from female uh, uh, response, uh, not just prevention, but actual response, dealing with the female victims, girl victims, um, is often, uh, especially in cases gathering um, witnesses and protecting uh, victims of, of these crimes is, is very much driven by them. Um, the other sad statistics is less than 15% of the negotiators, the peace negotiators are women, less than 10% of the mediators are women, and less than 10% of the signatories to peace agreements are women. So again, these statistics show a very incremental level of progress. Um, 
you know, maybe 20 years ago, these numbers were closer to zero. Um, so the fact that we have 10 to 20% is an improvement, but we're nowhere near the uh, goal of 50%. Women and girls are, however, a plurality of the victims of war, terror, and genocide. Just ask the Darfuri women in Sudan, the Yazidi women in Iraq, or the Hinga, Rohingya women in Myanmar. For the, they don't only suffer the vagaries of violence and the deprivations of poverty driven by conflict, but in addition, to the extent that men suffer those things as well, in addition, women and girls suffer what I precisely described, rape, what, rape as a weapon of war and other forms of sexual violence, including in the 21st century, uh, something we thought we'd never see again in human history, which is sexual slavery and sexual enslavement. These have become increasingly common in different conflicts, um, most uh, visibly in the situation of the Yazidis in Iraq, but that's not the only. We saw it also in the Bosnian uh, crisis. So the 21st century has, has, in a sense, been a setback, um, a shameful revival, uh, not so much because of government activity, but because of non-state activity, whether as armed actors, militants, traffickers, cr common uh, organized crime criminals, and of course, the terrorist and uh, nihilistic uh, uh, jihadi and uh, white supremacist movements around the world. So one would hope that it's better at the national level. It's a little bit better. We're more close to 25% than 20%. Um, but although women comprise more than 50% of the world's population in legislators around the world, women are outnumbered still four to one, including in the Western and the Scandinavian countries. No country, not a single country, has fully attained gender equality. The closest are the Scandinavian countries, Iceland, Norway, Finland, and Sweden, who lead the world in their progress towards the goal of closing the gender gap, but even they are not there yet. It comes as no surprise that the greatest gender caps are primarily in Africa, Asia, and the Latin American and Caribbean regions. And, but of the 29 female heads of states currently in uh, power, there seems to be greater geographic diversity than that gap would suggest. We have eight from Western Europe, seven from Eastern Europe, five from Africa, five from Latin America and Caribbean, and four from Asia. So the percentage of women in leadership positions in international organization is also growing, but at, at a much slower pace. There has yet, for instance, to be a female UN Secretary General or an IEEE Director General or a CTBTO executive secretary. I could be corrected, but I'm not sure if we've even had candidates for those positions put forward. So we are, are um, also, unfortunately, not only the, the least represented in the leadership, but they are also the most represented in victims of prohibited misconduct in the work, workplace, in particular sexual harassment. Now, sexual harassment can take many forms, ranging from inappropriate innuendo to actual physical sexual assault. Uh, any un con uh, unconsensual, non-consensual touching, for instance, constitute assault in the criminal sense of the world. And sadly, a recent survey of the entire UN system, all those who are part of the civil service uh, ICSC, including the IAEA, revealed that at least one in four women have faced some form of sexual harassment. Again, with a proviso that it's that whole gamut of sexual harassment. On a slightly brighter note, among the 10 countries that have had the most successful response to the COVID-19 pandemic, seven of them are led by women. Denmark, Finland, Germany, Iceland, New Zealand, Norway, and Taiwan. On the contrary, the, of the countries doing the worst, five of them are led by what are heralded as the most ma macho of the men's club, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Putin in Russia, Modi in India, Johnson in the UK, and Trump in the US. Although the latter spends more time and money on hair and makeup than most women I know. At the opposite side of the spectrum, the COVID-19 pandemic has set gender equality back many years. The UN has warned that women and girls bear the brunt of the socioeconomic impact of the COVID pandemic, especially those who are refugees, internally displaced, or stateless, and at the national level, sadly, domestic violence and child abuse are surging across the globe as a result of the lockdowns. So I regret to say that as we mark the 21st, 20th anniversary of the uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, there is very little to celebrate. Wow, Mona. Sorry. Well, first of all, <laughs> 
thank you for your your experience for your engagement with these issues i mean this is this is terrific work and and this data speaks for themselves um so I want actually to connect to uh, something both you, Renata, and, and you, Mona, have, have mentioned, which is really is, uh, so who actually can make, can help facilitate progress in, in these issues? And also, how do we help rethinking the gender gap and the, the, the put in place of, of the right policies for this? And Jenny, I want to go to you because you have, uh, you have, demonstrated great talent in bridging policy in academia. You thrive in the academic circles. You have written a lot. Also a very important contribution on women and nuclear weapons, redressing the gender gap. Um, so, and you're also a Pony uh, scholar from the Center of Strategic uh, Studies, uh, really leading the way somehow to reshape the nuclear discussion. And I wonder if you could actually talk a little bit about the gender gap in the academic community. And uh, uh, there was a fantastic article, a very depressing one a few years ago that basically mentioned that female, um, female authors are much less cited uh, than uh, male authors, even though they might make more convincing scholarly arguments. So, so there is a clear academic discrimination in this. So could you talk a little bit about your experience and also uh, because you work also with CTBTO, if you could also uh, talk about what are the policy impacts of this uh, intellectual uh, gender gap. Hi, Laura. Thank you, Francesca, for your questions and for moderating the session. And thank you to Peter, Atomic Reporters, and Konrad Adenauer Stiftum for including me in this great conversation today. Honored to join this group of experts. Um, so what is the gender gap in academia as uh, Francesca has noted, and why does it exist? Well, research has shown that the gender gap in academia exists, and it seems no sector is free from the gender imbalance um, there is an imbalance in senior leadership in academia that has been noted by several studies. For instance, one study indicated that in the United Kingdom's higher education sector, where 45% of academics are female, only a quarter of professors are female. And within the Russell Group of Universities in the UK, 20% uh, of vice chancellor roles are held by women. So you see the numbers um, indicate that imbalance exists. And several research findings challenge the assumption that the gender gap is due to maternal, domestic, or childcare roles, which is really interesting, and indicate that this factor does not explain why women are not getting promoted to the extent that men are in academia. And the imbalance in senior leadership in academia has been attributed to a number of other um, complicated factors, including um, some of the following. So women in, in academia seem to take on a load of non-promotable tasks and activities, um, often described as housekeeping roles. And when I was going through this, I, I saw myself in a lot of these examples, um, such as organizing conferences, events, sitting on various committees, all, all great collegial activities, um, attending departmental meetings, engaging in external activities, such as public speaking roles, but these activities uh, don't build the necessary credits when candidates are up for promotion committees in the academic um, system. So, and, and yes, again, I saw myself going, yeah, yeah, I, I do volunteer for a lot of these activities, which are great and are rewarding, but not rewarding in the way that leads to promotions in the academic ladder. So in academia, as you know, uh, values work that delivers results and impact, um, high value outputs, including publishing research, in high-ranking journals and winning uh, funds, research grants for research resulting in more publications and higher-ranking journals. Um, so that also relies on a strong network of mutual support from the community, from the academics. And that includes, um, as Francesca mentioned, being cited um, for your academic work and your publications. Um, so you really need that uh, network and that support from your peers. Uh, so research results again show that managing childcare and maternal duty roles could not explain why women don't get promoted. Um, and the real barriers seem to emerge from institutional and individual biases. 
attitudes of line managers, um, as well as the self-limiting beliefs sometimes of women have, uh, which has um, which leads to this um, concept of the sticky floor phenomena. Um, so unconscious biases are, are and discrimination exist in all sectors and need to be recognized. And um, opposed to the glass ceiling concept that we hear about, uh, the sticky floor concept has been used by some to attempt to explain why women don't progress through higher levels of middle management in academia and in other sectors, of course. Um, and some of these unconscious biases lead to actions and behavior that cause unintentional barriers. Um, and again, I mentioned attitudes of line managers towards female team members, assumptions of decision makers um, stop female colleagues being offered roles perhaps that may include traveling for extended period, periods, conducting field work, perhaps these attitudes that they believe that women wouldn't um, necessarily be um, best suited for these roles. Um, and also assumption that women have less of an appetite for these types of activities, or perhaps may not be able to cope with this, uh, with the stresses of this work. Um, so these biases that exist um, have been, have a potential effect uh, that new roles uh, might not even be discussed with them, or career development opportunities might not be offered to women in, in the sector. Um, so female academics could carefully consider their careers and question what activities to invest their time and resources on, and also how to choose to be a good citizen in the workplace. Obviously, we all want to be collegial and, and volunteer for all these great activities, but um, perhaps thinking a bit more strategically of what to invest your time and resources in. Um, I got advice from a, a very um, dear former boss and colleague, and she just said, Jenny, <laughs> you have to be smart about your approach. Um, you can be nice, but you must be smart in your strategy. Um, it is important for women to get clarity on the routes for promotion. I think that that really helps. Um, and commitment to investing time for research and other work that is promotion worthy um, in the end of the day uh, um, in order to, to get uh, climb the ladder within academia. And it's also important to build the networks across departments, sec sectors, sections, um, across universities um, in order to build the resources that could lead to research and funding opportunities and other opportunities such as uh, networks such as CSIS network, which is a great um, resource uh, um, in promoting uh, development activities for um, not just emerging, but mid-level career um, experts. Um, research has also found that championing has been particularly effective for women. So senior academics have the potential to take on those championing roles, creating opportunities by opening doors to research projects, taking on uh, a fellow um, academic and, and peer for uh, research projects, cross departmental uh, collaborations and helping women really navigate the promotional um, minefield that can be uh, can be encountered. And I think again, uh, promoting the academic work of others is very important and one form of championing. So using citations from other uh, female academics in our articles, chapters and presentations can help promote the work of others. And I also think not only that for uh, female colleagues but also emerging experts, I think it's really important to promote uh, the next generation of academics um, and not just resort to Yes, you do have your, um, your primary uh, core um, resources, but promote the emerging work of, of scholars. And how does this all affect the field of international security? Uh, so gender, but also the broader diversity and balance in academia and think tanks, I would also include, affects the field of international security as it means that fewer women and less diverse individuals reach the senior levels in academia and in, in think tanks that may potentially lead to gaining significant research grants for research that will inform international security policy issue areas. As some academics rotate between academia, think tanks and civil service, it also limits the diversity that policy circles can have. And it can also potentially mean that the regime, the nuclear nonproliferation regime suffers from it as there's a less rich, uh, as it would be less rich in diversity of perspectives and approaches, a greater diversity of perspectives, whether gender, nationality, or strategic culture, 
could perhaps shed light and provide a deeper understanding of international security challenges and the possible approaches to address these challenges. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and allow for, for more discussion. Thank you, Francesca. Fantastic, thank you so much. Before I give the floor to uh, my last speaker, I would like to prepare uh, all, your, uh, all, uh, all of you attending this workshop uh, to prepare your questions so that we can go into more interactive discussion. I do have a lot of questions for these panelists, so, uh, but I'll, I'll be very happy to take yours uh, um, after our, our last speaker. I think if there is somebody who represents a role model for certainly a successful career in arms control and nuclear non-proliferation, this role model is Ambassador Laura Holgate. I say this because Laura, you have reached really the pinnacle of this career. You've done it with grace, with uh, collegiality, uh, with incredible talent, hard work, and I think you represent really the best of what the field can offer. Um, and so I want to really ask a, a, a personal question. You have been the ambassador, the US ambassador to the International Atomic Energy Agency and the US system in Vienna. And recent uh, UNICEF report has talked about this uh, slight rise in the number of female ambassadors around the world that should be celebrated. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit the behind the scenes of being a woman in a heavy, uh, men dominated environment when you had to lead the, the negotiations of the GCPOA with maybe countries that are not necessarily that, uh, you know, uh, in favor of gender equality. How does this play out at that high level diplomacy? Well, thanks, Francesca. And um, I'm sorry to have had a misfire on my calendar. It's great to be with everybody and, and to have heard at least uh, part of Jenny's presentation. Uh, excellent as always. Um, it's, um, you know, I, there's a lot of um, difference in how different women approach it, uh, uh, approach the, their particular roles. And I'm, I'm one of those who wants to highlight the diversity within the, the population of women who work in this area, um, even though there may be some stereotypical uh, gender tendencies that uh, that also come out. Um, I would say I I haven't the only time I've had a very particular experience in a negotiating process um, where my opposite number was specifically disrespecting me um, was in a bilateral negotiation on a, on a project. Um, where I, I believe I was the only woman in the room, but I was also le leading the delegation. Um, but it didn't, they didn't perceive me as the leader because I was a woman. And so the, the opposite number was engaging with me uh, in a not very respectful way. I will be respectful and not mention which country <laughs> this was, um, much less the individual, but um, I think in the multilateral context, just the fact that there are more people in the room uh, tends to mean there are more women in the room. And so I, I can't think of a single instance in a multilateral engagement where I was the only woman. Uh, and I think that, uh, that just by itself you know, creates a very different dynamic, even though the, the women were far from the majority or even 50%. Um, you know, I think the research suggests that you kind of need, you know, 30% or so, between 25 and 30% um, women in the room before you really start to see the benefit of having that, those diverse perspectives in the room at all. Um, that if all you have is one or two women in a conversation, that that's not likely to create enough critical mass. Um, where they might be still unwilling to speak up and, and share a different perspective if they really feel like they're gonna be the only one in the room who might have that perspective or who might, who, who might receive that perspective in a welcoming and open-minded way. And so the, I mean, we're all familiar with the tokenization uh, experience. I, I'd like to think that in the generation that's represented on this call that we're past that token period, but I do think we're, we have a little bit farther to go even on getting that critical mass um, of, of participation. Um, probably the most time 
that I've spent in multilateral negotiations involved during the nuclear security summits. And there, I feel like I had a, a privileged position because I was representing a president who was personally quite committed to the issue. And so there was really no basis for anyone to question the authority that I brought to that conversation, to, to, uh, for anyone to challenge whether I really knew what I was talking about, because there was no one else in that room who was going to know better what the US president wanted out of that negotiation than me. Um, so I have to say, I found the process there. And in many cases, the US uh, Sherpa team um, was majority female. Um, it, it ebbed and flowed over the course of the, of the four summit preparatory processes. Um, but I do feel like that gave us the, both the flex, I, I feel like that gave us flexibility, not just the content of the negotiate, the identities of the negotiating team, but the fact that we were in a plurilateral context rather than a formal multilateral context. So, so we could pick and choose techniques Mm -hmm. uh, that worked for our goals and for that format. And I think one of the most important pieces, um, and maybe this goes to a, you know, a traditional feminine uh, perspective, was the notion of making sure that people felt that their, their inputs were perceived, respected, and that they had a chance to get feedback on those. We did mm -hmm. an enormous amount of public negotiation uh, of the text of the documents that we were working on. And every single comment that was ever made by any delegation was reflected at some point in a text. Um, and they had a chance to see what it would look like, that other people had a chance to react to it, to support it, to question it, to improve it. Uh, and so I think that transparency of process was part of the success of the process. But I also think that, um, you know, that has, um, you know, that's a, a trait that is often associated uh, with uh, women's style of, of working. Um, certainly my approach, uh, whether as a manager or as a representative of my, of my country, um, is that information is empowering and should be, and, and the more you share it, the more power it has. Um, whether that's in terms of making sure that my teams understand what each other is doing, or whether it's getting on the same fact page with counterparts uh, so that we can then come to a common approach or at least understand each other's differences from a common uh, perspective. So I think that that uh, visibility of communication um, is an important component of successful diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mm -hmm. certainly a piece that I, uh, that I have prioritized in my work um, as, as a, both a capital D diplomat and a small d diplomat. <laughs> Fantastic. I think we are, we are starting to actually um, uh, see some of this argument being validated. I think you and Renata started talking about these gender norms, right? And there is a style to how women approach the high level discussions and, and, and what they seek out of all this uh, like more participatory and inclusive uh, discussions. So I want to open the floor and ask the um, attendees to this workshop if they have questions at this point and uh, who they want to direct their questions to. Questions? Please, and please, please, for the sake of uh, our participants on the Zoom, introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, hello, my name is Michael Audrid. I'm working for the Ministry of Defense. Currently, I'm posted in the permanent mission of Austria to the OSCE. Um, I just want to thank you for your very interesting interventions altogether. So I just want actually to comment a little bit. Um, first of all, about my personal opinion. Um, I think it's a very good choice of the organizers of this forum um, to give place and room um, for this topic here in this uh, domain. 
as you mentioned it, uh, women are underrepresented. Uh, I'm a strong believer of this approach um, because as I told, I'm actually coming from the military domain. So as you would say, maybe even also some kind of macho style background. Um, and I have to admit, I had to be convinced as well. I got in touch with the gender topic myself quite late, actually in a um, senior officers course uh, where it got my attention. And I continued following on this um, by uh, visiting uh, different courses, like for example, the European Union Gender and Operations course. And I recently came back from uh, the European Union monitoring mission in Georgia, where I was also acting as a gender focal point. And the topic continues uh, to be in my place, especially also now in the OSCD. I had the chance, even though I just uh, jumped into this uh, posting now, to follow the latest uh, ministerial council talks. And I was uh, following the discussions in the forum for, um, for the, security, um, uh, the security committee uh, FSC, um, and it was quite interesting to see one of the topics which was uh, part of getting a draft decision for the Ministerial Council was uh, on 1325, not only because of the anniversary, on the anniversary but also uh, to raise it in the work of the FSC, of OSC and also to promote, as you mentioned, the full, equal and meaningful participation also in the work of OSE, which is aiming as well on arms control and confidence, trust building measures. Um, and that's the reason why it's important to continue um, to keep these topics high on the agenda, to convince people and uh, argue as you did very well and clear uh, for the benefits of these topics and what benefits it can raise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I get back, uh, Mikhail, this is, this is very interesting. Could I then pose a question uh, to whoever wants to take it uh, on the panel? How should we think about training, for example, the military on this issue? What, what are some of the things that maybe you have come across that might be successful in using Mikhail uh, phrasing to be convinced that this is worth attention? Uh, Mona, can I get started with you? Because I think you have had some, some interesting uh, exchange with the peacekeeping operations, and I'm sure you have thought a lot about training the military what they need to be convinced about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you again. And I want to thank our Austrian colleague for his uh, honesty in, uh, in his uh, evolution, let's say, on the subject. Um, indeed, um, uh, I've had most experience with the military, in fact, um, training both in my capacity in the UN as well as since leaving the UN. Um, uh, several engagements at the national as well as international level training peacekeepers. And uh, as with everything else, there's three layers to it. There's the training, the leadership, and um, you know those are the people who are actually appointed, recruited, and deployed. Um, and I have to train a female force commander. I've trained some SRSGs, the special representatives of the Secretary General, who lead the missions. Um, but so that's the first thing you notice in that capacity is that there's. Um, I, I understand that since I left the UN, there's been two female force commanders, so that's an improvement. Um, uh, the, the second layer is in understanding the mandate. So there are, you know, the, the peacekeeping mandates tend to be everything but the kitchen sink these days, everything from capacity building to protection of civilian, civilians, from disarmament to uh, human rights monitoring to peace negotiations to peace enforcement tasks. So it's rather a uh, a, a, a part, let's call it, of, of, of several uh, goals. 
um, all of which technically you're mainstreaming several thematic things. One is women, the second is children, and the third is protection of civilians, which includes women and children, but they're seen as three separate, uh, three separate uh, themes and three separate uh, priority uh, activities within each of the mandates. So you have at least three opportunities to achieve these goals. Children and girls, women are women, and protection of civilians, most of the civilians who are harmed by conflict, whether it's war, whether it's uh, rebe rebellion or other forms of militant activity, whether it's genocide, whether it's terror, it, the women are always a disproportionate number of those impacted, not just in terms of uh, death and injury, but also in terms of socioeconomic impact. So merely putting that on, on the screen, letting them kind of absorb the fact of it. And you'd be surprised, it's women who need to be made aware as much as men. It's not just men who don't know, women don't know. They're you know, so busy in their own lives that they don't realize, you know, they're fighting their little battle for mobility in the ranks of whatever institution they're a part of. They're not thinking of how this translates in, in the mandate implementation field. So you need to wake up the women as well. And if I'm going to be really honest, I have found through my career that men are far more willing to, uh, to, to give that mentoring than, than women have, at least in my experience. My mentors are all men. Um, I, I say I don't have a single female mentor. I have plenty of females who have inspired me by their example. But the men who've actually taken an interest in mobilizing and advancing my career are, are, I mean, the, 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 the bosses that I've had have been men, not women. Um, so there's a lot that we need to look to ourselves as, as uh, Laura rightly noted and, and give our help, our advice, our step up to our future generations. Um, and the third is in the actual uh, reminder that they can make a difference. Um, that it's not just being a statistic, that it's about each one male and female uh, making, you know, remembering, and this sounds a little bit flower childy, but the goals of the UN are, are very idealistic and they're very, um, not just about peace and security, but about well-being, about sustainable development and above human rights. And this is fundamentally a human rights issue. And people think that this is like pie in the sky and some kind of flower child, but we have to remember that the people who drafted the charter and set those goals for us to save us from the scourge of war, to protect the dignity of the human, human person, were, were survivors of the, of the two world wars. They were real politique par excellence, the Winston Churchills and the uh, Roosevelt's and the Truman's and the Stalin's of the world. They're not hippies, they're not poets, and they're certainly not uh, philosophers. They were actual war-hardened superpowers who were very aware of the consequences of failing to respect the equality of each human person and the human rights of each person, and that includes women and girls. So that's my... Uh, Thank you. Laura, I want to go, uh, thank you so much, Mona. I want to get to you actually on the mentoring because you have launched in 2018 uh, this uh, now worldwide, worldwide uh, famous initiative, the Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy. And um, I think you did it with specific goals in mind also to wake up a little bit women uh, leaders to take responsibility for the mentoring of the new generation. Could you tell us a little bit about what your experience is there and the impact that you, you the, the initiative is having? Well, thank you for that, that opportunity. The, the Gender Champions is uh, builds on a concept that was already invented and has been promulgating throughout the UN system and the, multi the formal multilateral system um, and that began in Geneva uh, with my, my fellow ambassador Pamela Hamamoto and, and some of her colleagues, uh, which is where I first learned about it. Um, but it, it really reflects the, the notion that there has been a lot of I would say peer mentoring and you know kind of bottom up work among women and a few male allies to enhance the role of women in various institutions. But the fact that there still is such a, a underrepresentation suggests that there are in fact institutional barriers. Um, and whether they're sticky floors or glass ceilings, they come from a construct of how organizations work uh, and how people within those organizations interact. And that you really need, in addition to the bottom up and side out work, you need top down commitment 
from the leaders of those organizations, whether they're women or whether they're men. And that was the insight of the gender champions concept was that was to ask the leaders of organizations to make a public set of pledges about how they themselves and their organizations would address the issues of gender equity, um, either or both in their programming and in their personnel uh, and staff policies. And so it was, we, we took that page very strongly from the diplomatic environments in Geneva and Vienna and now Rome and The Hague and Brussels and elsewhere and brought it to the global nuclear policy community starting in the United States, but now we have members uh, elsewhere as well. Um, uh, to the non-government communities that work in this area, uh, whether think tanks or uh, activist communities or the private sector. We now have a couple of business folks, um, professional societies uh, that reflect the participants in the nuclear policy context. Um, and the vast majority, because it's nuclear policy, the vast majority of those leaders are men. And therefore the majority of our champions are men. Um, and, but the most important thing about it is the public accountability, that they make these pledges in public. And then we do an annual report that has aggregate performance against those aggregate pledges. Um, we, we don't do a naming and shaming with each individual organization, although their pledges are there for all to see on the website uh, and people can make their own judgments about the degree to which they've lived up to those, those pledges. Um, we did have last year with our first, um, our first um, impact uh, report that uh, well over 60% uh, of the pledges had been met and many of them were, were in the course of, of executing them were found to be kind of enduring pledges. They, they were things that you would always do that you never really finished doing them. And so it didn't necessarily make sense to think about them being complete. Um, so, but, but one of the things in that a lot of organizations have pledged to do is in the mentoring context. Uh, whether that's a, a specific pledge from the champion, him or herself, uh, whether it's an institutional pledge um, or whether it's a particular program uh, that various organizations are doing. And in fact, we've had a very dedicated conversation uh, within the, the focal points who have the day-to-day -day responsibilities within these organizations uh, whose members are, whose leaders are champions uh, about mentoring. And if I can just toot my own horn, my organization's horn here for a minute, we're actually doing uh, tomorrow a session on mentoring uh, for the, the um, nuclear community uh, with several speakers uh, from NTI and other organizations. And so I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can pop that in the chat uh, and people can sign up and participate in that webinar if they're interested in learning more about best practice on mentoring in the diversity context. Terrific. Let me take uh, some more questions and then I'll get to you, uh, Jenny and Renata. Please. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Uh, my name is Brigitta. I work for the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. I would have one short question to Mona. Mona, you mentioned that only 10% of the mediators are women. Like from my experience with all the trainings I've done, it was basically women who, who were doing the, the uh, mediation. So how come there's such a difference? And I also wanted to ask all of the participants of the, of the panel, um, what kind of informal networks do exist or maybe formal networks um, I only know about the Women in International Security, I think, WIIS. Are there any other networks? And um, I was also wondering who, like which of the international organizations would be like, um, like the, the master in, 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 in gender, like I know in the OCE, like, um, there was the policy of the secretary general, like not to go to, to uh, male only panels and uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency is trying to have like 50% of, of senior managers, women within the next five years. So, 
So which of the organization could be taken a bit as, as an indicator for on, on, on that important work? Thank you. Thank you. Renata and Jenny, let me start with you. Renata. Uh, thank you very much, Francesca, and thank you for the question. Um, I mean, there was a specific part for Mona, but more Mona. about uh, informal and formal networks. Uh, as it has been mentioned already, I think we've seen uh, international gender champions, who, which, which they have a hub in Vienna. I think they've been very important in fostering um, a leadership culture of, of avoiding all male panels and all female panels, but also of taking smart commitments to improve um, gender equality in their organizations. And we see that that has had a, a positive effect and uh, very much in action, concrete action, but also in the rhetoric. I mean, we, we hear more about this topic than, than never before. I just wanted to point out, I mean, what, what um, the colleague now just said, that she feels there are more women than they actually you see in the statistics. I think that's why it's important that we have the statistics, because a lot of the time we see a few women in the room and we think, oh, that's okay. But then if we take a step back and we really look at it, and it's, it's, all, it's never more than 30%. So um, it's still we are still at the stage that we need to be counting women. I hope that they will, will, will whether they will come or we don't need to do that anymore. But we, that's that's where we are at, and it's important to track this data and make it available so we are all aware of it. And in addition to the issue of networks, mentoring, and and all these things, I I would like to point out also. Creating a culture where women feel welcome and part of, uh, because let's say in the world that we operate in the UN, this is something that was brought to me to my attention this year, is that a lot of conventions have rules of procedures that mention him and his and he, and uh, so it it it. it it's a discrimination, right? You're talking about delegates only using the male pronoun, so you don't anticipate that a woman will be doing that job. And when member states tried to change this here in Geneva, a couple of, uh, there was a concrete proposal by Australia in the uh, Conference on Disarmament to, to change the male pronouns for the representative, the representative. That didn't gain traction. They weren't, unable, they weren't able to change to, in my view, which would be merely like an update, a technical update, shouldn't even be politicized. Um, there was backlash against that. So there is still, in a sense, uh, uh, a perception that we are operating in a world that it's not our world and it's not welcoming to us. So, and, and it's still, this type of minor issues are still very much a battle. So um, I would just like to point out, in addition to trainings and focusing on the individual, thinking about you know, the structures and the culture in which we operate also and what we can do to change that. Yeah, counting women is still important. I will remember that quote for a long time, Renata, and thank you for doing the job you're doing. Jenny. Yes, I just want to echo. Uh, thank you, Renata. I think your studies are incredible, and I think they're very important. And the numbers do matter. You know, we still need those those hard facts uh, to to show um, what's going on. Um, as far as networks in Austria, you've mentioned women in international security. They have national chapters all over. I used to be in the UK one before I moved to Austria, um, and there's a lot of younger women in the uh, Vienna chapter which could um, really benefit from championing and mentorship. So um, I, I encourage you to get involved there. There's also women in nuclear, which is targeted at the nuclear uh, community, um, but they're also an international uh, network and they have a local chapter in Vienna. Um, and I just wanna thank uh, the, the Gender Champions Initiative because I think they have done a phenomenal role in making it trendy and uh, cool to really champion uh, gender equality. I think um, if you see a lot of the uh, organization leaders um, using this platform and making it a very cool and trendy thing, I think that helps uh, bring this forward. You see the IEA um, DG's initiative for gender parity by, is it 2025? Um, all these things matter immensely. And I think um, it's a really 
um, inspirational way forward. So thank you. Fantastic. Mona, you have- Claudia? You have the... Wait, we, uh, we still have a, an answer from uh, Mona. All right. I'll be quick. Uh, indeed, um, I think the statistic is drawn on, on new unled mediations. It's not worldwide mediation. So that's where the statistics comes from. Um, so it's a very specific set of statistics I gave about UN peacekeeping and peace processes um, as reported to uh, the Security Council on the occasion of the 20th anniversary. Um, uh, I, I fully agree that gender champions and gender initiatives are making uh, great progress in what I think is a nascent form of public accountability. Um, but we shouldn't hesitate to name and shame. We shouldn't hesitate to incur a little bit of a price tag for those who fail to live up to, uh, their, to, their, to their publicly stated commitments. Because we have more than enough concept, more than enough definition, more than enough commitment, more than enough rhetoric, more than enough. But where we're failing is an actual result. Um, and I'm not denying that progress has been made and will continue to be made, but is it being, you know, the, the first commitment by the UN Secretary General was for gender parity by the year 2000. Here we are in 2020, 20 years after that initial goal, and we're not there yet. And what I've noticed is that at the beginning of any tenure of a Secretary General, and I hope this doesn't translate to the Director General currently at the IAEA, they do really well in their first two years. They're very visible, they're very, you know, uh, they're very loud and clear about their intention and their, and their commitment. And then by their eighth year or their 10th year, depending on whether it's a four or five year mandate, the numbers recede. So there is a lot of sort of uh, public prestige, but then the accountability fades and so does the results. So I think we need to keep a toast to the fire. Fantastic. Peter, let's take more questions. Please. Claudia. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank all of you, because my, my name is Claudia Crawford. I'm the head of the Konrad Arno Foundation here in, in Vienna. Uh, and, and just to give you the background of, about our office, we are here in Vienna for one a year uh, uh, for now. Uh, we started last year. I came in May to Vienna and we started officially in October. So we are rather young here in, in Vienna, but as you may know, the Konrad Arnold Foundation, of course, is more than six years old and uh, focused on various uh, issues. But here in Vienna, we especially uh, focus on multilateral dialogue. And for myself, I uh, would like to focus uh, very strongly on arms control. That's why we have this seminar today. I'm, I'm very grateful to all you speakers. Um, uh, Many times I felt remind, um, on, on, I would like to say, in my former life. So I used to be a politician. And uh, I, I, I remember on a meeting, I, I took over the presidency of the minister council uh, of the youth minister from the European Union. Uh, I was at that time federal minister for women and youth. And, we sat in the room and I, I looked around, I, I had to share this meeting and I, I was the only women in this room, they weren't only men, my, my colleagues were just female and male. And not only this, I was 28 in that time, so I was pretty young. <laughs> and I will never forget how the men looked at me and uh, I looked to them and we had a little bit so irritating and then we got to the understanding, okay, I have to share and I will do it. And this was okay, it was, uh, smoothly done, but it made me aware um, in what a situation uh, I am. And I was used to it because I was uh, electronic um, by training and electronic by training and studied uh, cybernetic automation. So I was used to a rather male environment. And nowadays, if I look around as a diplomatic sphere, I got as more the impression that rather a lot of women there because compared to 20 years ago in the politics it was almost nothing and um, also when uh, I think it's, it was Renata mentioned the language uh, thing uh, in, in German it's uh, much more complicated because we not only have him and his and he we have for every more or less position 
a man and a female expression, a male and female expression, and to meet the gender uh, condition, it makes it sometimes very annoying and difficult to really speaking gender conform and we, we have a, a huge struggle about it how how to really respect the fact that we are men and and, and women and and to to make it visible uh, for everybody in such meetings and i think we don't have a, a very good solution now for this and sometimes i'm afraid we, we put so much energy in, in this struggle and miss the real battle we have to fight for and this means for me to bring more women in, in the decision-making processes, either in the politics or in, 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 in the diplomacy, but also in, in, in management and in, in, in companies and, and wherever you can look around, we don't have enough women. And for this reason, I'm worried to see that looking around in the young generation, I have the impression sometimes the ambitions of women uh, are decreasing and not increasing. Mm. So um, to, to really create an atmosphere where uh, girls, young women are interested in achieving positions or at least achieving um, uh, topics they really would like to, to bring all the engagement in. Um, this is so necessary at the moment because I have the impression there is a, a rather a fall down in this and decreasing in this. And therefore, uh, especially if it comes to topics like uh, engineering or uh, military things or arms controls, so the typical more male topics to uh, push younger women to, to become interested in those fields. And this really needs uh, role models. It reads this mentoring. It, it means um, to, to, to bring it in a way that uh, they feel attracted by it. And I, I guess we have to put more ambitious in this field um, to start much earlier. Uh, it's too late to wonder when we in, in, in my age now and we look around and, and see not uh, enough women in the room. Uh, they, there has to be started much more earlier in the school times. And sometimes uh, we should think about how to start in families to create role models in families. I, my, my mother was an engineer. That was a big reason for me becoming an engineer. So, and, and that means this is not focused on only on arms con control and on our topic today, but rather an, is a real um, social issue we, we have to focus on. And therefore, I think the work you do is so important because you are these role models and we, we need way, ways to, to promote it and to, to show more women what perspectives there, there is, uh, there are, and, and they could achieve if they feel uh, supported and, and um, get also the idea to, to achieve those things. So thank you very much about it. And I would love to stay in contact um, to also exchange ideas, what our foundation, Conrad Arno Foundation can do to promote women, to uh, um, support them in looking for issues like arm controls and, and to have the connection to uh, show them role models uh, that they get more ambitious. So thank you. Fantastic, Claudia. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, can I pick your brain, ladies, on something that uh, Claudia said, which I also think it's a, it's a very interesting question. When you try to engage this current generation, the Gen Z, right? and you come with the lenses of gender, they tell you that you are a dinosaurs, right? Because gender is so 20th century. You know, women are fine now, you know? I mean, they are, they are, they, there are other issues. And so one of my questions is, um, in a post-gender world, or so it seems, for this generation, how can we still really be um, incentivizing 
this young, young new leaders to actually take this issue seriously. And one point that Renata made yesterday is there is this new phrasing about gender queer, right? The refusal of being associated with a specific gender, which is very prevalent among the Gen Z um, uh, teenagers today. So what would you say to a teenager that says gender is 20th century? Don't bother with this. Mona, you go first. I have this conversation almost daily with my niece who accuses me of being uncool precisely because I continue to think in terms of the binaries, you know, black and white, gay and straight, uh, male, female. And she and she she's like, I thought you were cooler than that. You know, so there's this constant struggle to prove to her that yes, I'm cool enough to be her aunt, and yet. Uh, you know, still living in the real world where these things, uh, while progress has been made, we're still far from rising above them. And the best analogy is the election of President Obama in the United States. Many said that, oh, racism is over. You have a black or at least half black uh, uh, African-American in, in the highest office, but it actually unleashed and exposed the trem tremendous reservoir of racism that existed in the country. Um, that had been kind of hiding under some kind of hidden rock or kind of too ashamed to come out. But with a black man in the White House, these, these ugly tendencies felt, you know, uh, challenged enough to, to unleash and became very public. And it looked like we were going backwards instead of having going forwards. But I think the same thing happens with, with female advancement. Um, we have good news, good news, bad news. Um, and I'm gonna start with the good news because the good news actually, I think, engenders the bad news. The better we do, the better women are achieving and succeeding and becoming more and more visible and becoming, uh, approaching that arch of justice where we are 30%, 40%, 50%, the more antagonized that sector of society that tends to be young, white, and this, and feeling disenfranchised, losing their sense of racial superiority and their sense of sexual superiority um, becomes more and more um, uh, radicalized. There's no other word for it. They, they actually become militant. Um, I've seen it happen in my own region where these men feel um, uh, so uh, lack of belonging. They, they see the, the traditional classical sense of society leaving them out because as that fades, their role in it fades. So that, and I don't mean to be alarmist, but the more successful we are, the greater the danger from these elements that feel threatened by our advancement and threatened by our visibility as succeeding actors, both economically, politically, and as well as socially. But my hope resides in, in fact, that very generation um, because it's the girls who stand out. It's the Greta Thunberg and the Malala and the most recently named kid of the year I can't pronounce her first name, uh, uh, but I'm gonna try, uh, Jitan Jali Rao, who are making the difference in science and politics and climate change and the existential threats that face the world. Uh, so my hope, as it does on a personal level from my niece and my nephew, that they're smarter than us, wiser than us, braver than us, um, but also in the fact that it is girls that are making headlines today. So I'm very optimistic about the future, despite the great dangers that face us. Renata, can I thank you? Thank you, terrific answer. Renata, can I can I pick on you now? Because you have you have interviewed a lot of diplomats. Uh, you are also like closer to this generation in age, and and I think you have followed this debate about the post gender society. What would you say? What what are some of the things you notice about this discussion in this post gender framework? Yeah, so I actually, I mean, I've been doing research on uh, women and men participation in arms control and disarmament. And I say women and men because that's the data we have, right? Uh, we don't have uh, that much diplomats that openly identify as genderqueer, as transgender. So uh, although we, uh, in our research, we recognize that gender is a spectrum that goes beyond this binary, in practical terms, we are still working with uh, these two categories because that's uh, the reality we work with. 
And the reality is that the diplomats are not that young, the ones that I interview. So I, I don't know much. I mean, as a researcher, I don't have a background in youth or anything like that. So what I know is uh, from following the media, the public debate, but what you are, I would like to put a, a different argument for a, a different point of view, Francesca, is that we hear a lot more of people and governments and leaders using the word feminist and making sure feminism is understood as equality, not women prevailing over men, but women having the same rights, responsibilities, opportunities that men. And I think this is very much in vogue with the younger generation as well, young um, girls and boys that, ident that you know, state themselves as feminists. So I, I, this is something I would ca caution. I don't know if we are that post, if this post gender, how big this is of a movement, if we also have the movement for feminist, uh, j just in terms of political stance, but also in terms of uh, methodological uh, uh, research, like research methodologies that are feminist, research perspectives that are feminist, governments that are feminists, and foreign policies that are feminists. And we have a set of tools called, let's say, gender-based analysis and gender analysis frameworks, and we've been seeing this being rolled out and mainstreaming across different levels. So I, I don't know that much of a, an impact that, that uh, this post-gender movement may have, but I think if it is something that makes uh, a more welcoming environment that we acknowledge and make visible people that don't fit uh, whatever stereotype you have in your head, I think that's, that's very a, a welcoming development. And as I've been talking about gender as an analytical perspective, I would just like to take a moment to say what's the obvious, but sometimes it needs to be said, that participation is just the first step. Uh, the way we approach this topic at UNIDIR is that we talk about including uh, women and, and people of gender, uh, of, of various gender in conversation, but there is an outcome that we envisage, and this outcome is more diverse and sustainable uh, decisions. Um, and, and this also means that we need also analytical frameworks to improve the decisions that we take, to make sure they are not gender blind, to make sure that they don't exacerbate already existing gender inequalities. And in this sense, gender as an analytical perspective is something that we also explore. We have, a, we, together with a group of countries, UNIDIR put forward a working paper for the Non-Proliferation uh, Preparatory Committee last year that proposes a gender analysis for nuclear policy making. What would be the issues that you need to consider uh, when developing nuclear policies for non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful uses that relate to gender. So just to say, making it practical also uh, for the various policy areas, how you implement a gender approach to a certain topic as well. Yeah, great point. Laura? It's a, it's a really good question and it's, um, I have to say with, uh, uh, from I, my experience is more like that of Renata's. Um, we've got, NTI has a, an, a very active intern program. And so we do, we're getting that Gen Z into our, into our community. Um, and we're using that as a way to improve diversity uh, in the nuclear policy space that NTI inhabits. Um, and I would say that, that, the, that the young women that I encounter in our intern program are very aware of the challenges that, uh, the gender-based challenges that exist in our community, but not just the gender-based challenges, racial issues, other, other issues of broader representation and underrepresentation. Um, and that is, a, I think, a, a, a continuing struggle uh, for the nuclear policy community. Um, what's been interesting is that uh, some of those organizations that are involved in the gender champions approach have used that tool and the public pledging of that to incorporate other kinds of diversity, whether uh, in the LGBTQ mm -hmm. context, in the racial context, um, other types of ways of diversifying their communities and their activities uh, in, in, and to do so in a public way 
that, that provides both visibility and accountability. And so uh, you can use these different existing tools that may be around a binary to be more inclusive uh, in the actions that you're actually taking. And we still have a long way in which things that changes to how institutions work that improve the environment uh, for women, improve it for everybody. <laughs> things like parental leave, things like flexibility. You know, suddenly we all know how to telework, whereas a lot of companies and, and organizations discourage that. Um, the flexibility that goes along with um, the, the um, and, and th with policies that are designed to enhance the, um, the presence and, and impact and comfort level of women in an organization is, um, you know, even down to what's the temperature <laughs> in the office. Um, you know, plenty of studies now showing that um, men and women actually have different temperatures at which they perform better. Uh, and maybe it's just the US air conditioning systems, but that, that are not replicated globally. But you know, having a having a sweater in your office is a thing <laughs> in the summertime. Um, because our offices are tuned to the comfort level of men in three-piece suits and ties. Um, so I think there's a lot of, you know, as dress codes. Um, become a little less uh, less severe. You know, we have an opportunity where everybody's life gets better by making it better for some of these underrepresented communities. Um, there will be a point where it starts to be a zero sum game, uh, where gains for these underrepresented groups start to mean losses for others. But we're a long way from that point, and there's a lot that can be done that actually has broad applicability. Fantastic. I want to take the last question. I want to give the floor to Jenny. So Peter, I'm running out of time, but I think we do have uh, the time for one more question. Tarek? You're gonna, Tarek, please. Hi, this is Tarek. So hi, Laura, Mona, and Jenny. I already said hi to Francesca and hi, Renata. Nice to meet you virtually. So I have a comment and, and a sort of a, a question. The comment builds on a comment already made by Mona. So last year was the selection of a new IAEA Director General. And there was one candidate who had been the chair of the Board of Governors, who had been the president of the IAEA General Conference, was a nuclear scientist by training, was the nuclear regulator of their country, and was also the governor for that country. And she happened to be a woman. And of the 35 votes, she got zero. Not a single country voted for her even though for the last few years, states have been voting in the IAEA on improving gender balance, giving women more roles. But here, when there was an opportunity, uh, nobody stood up to the plate and, and did the right thing. So it, I think it sort of sent a very negative message because in some respects, this candidate was more qualified than the other candidates one might argue. Um, so I was wondering whether somebody had a comment on that. But my question relates to um, uh, sort of the reactionary and negative comments one sometimes still gets that we are dealing with matters of national and international security and importance and we shouldn't introduce the gender issue into it. We should deal with it on, on the merit of the qualification of the persons uh, involved, so to speak, in order to form a delegation or to do the negotiation. So I was wondering what's the best way to deal with it other than the obvious one of having diversity, 50% of the population of the world are women and so on. Thank you. Jenny, get us started here. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Tariq, for your always um, probing questions. Um, the DJ candidate you, you mentioned, um, well, you, I think, um, probably states voted for the most qualified uh, candidate at the time. Um, and again, with how do you form a qualified uh, committee or a delegation? Yeah, I think it all goes down to the qualifications again. I, I wouldn't say, um, I, I don't know if you would say it has to be a 50-50 delegation. Um, yeah, tricky. Um, I think that's, that's as far as I would go on this. Laura. 
Thank we you, have Debbie. a very a very active community in the um, I think it's mainly U.S. based, but it's called NatSec Girl Squad. Um, it is a uh, both a hashtag and an, and a for profit organization um, that does uh, gender analysis uh, and recruitment in um, for national security companies. Um, but but the founder um, Maggie Feldman Pilch has a has a phrase that if you're soft on diversity. Is it me? Okay. I think uh, Laura. Am I frozen? Freezing? You're back. Okay. So, did you get the key point? If you're soft on diversity, you're soft on defense. Uh, that's the phrase mm -hmm. that uh, is promoted by this NatSec Girl Squad founder, this very uh, awesome. dynamic young woman, um, Maggie Feldman Pilch. And uh, her her point, I mean, this is backed up by study after study after study. I don't know why we still have to debate this question. When you have diverse voices in the room, the outcomes are better. They're more durable. And it's not just because you, you, you don't make errors of omission in the context of gender issues. It's just that generally, when you have a broader diversity of experience, of perspectives, of opportunities of mindsets of educational backgrounds of life experiences you are going to have better outcomes um, not necessarily easier decisions but you're going to have better outcomes they're going to be durable and they're going to work and so competent diversity i mean no one's arguing that incompetent people be included that's not what diversity discussions are about um, and if anyone is suggesting that there are that there's a competence gap um, you know, then that's, that's a different, <laughs> that is not an argument from facts, um, or from research or from experience. Um, so the question is, how do we incorporate that competent diversity to make better outcomes? And there is no more important topic to, to Tarek's point than national security. I mean, we cannot afford to leave half of our population on the other side of the door when those things are, are discussed. It, it, the, the conversation will simply be less rich, less effective, and, and less beneficial uh, for those involved. Wow. With this, I want to turn uh, back to Peter, but I want to thank you so very much, ladies. I think you are an inspiration to all of us for what you're doing, immense contribution really to advance uh, I think what we all want, which is a global, peaceful, inclusive, sustainable uh, community. And I think you are contributing immensely to this. So thank you so much for giving me the chance to interact with you today. Peter, over to you. I thank, I thank all of you very, very much. And I, I, a very, very quick anecdote. A long while ago, a dear, dear friend said, Peter, you think like a woman. And I thought, my God, man, that's the greatest compliment I could ever have. Now, I'm not sure that that, uh, you know, my mind process persisted for too long. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I agree completely with, 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 you know, strength through diversity, which of course was Laura's last point. Uh, let's keep working on it. Uh, thank you for supporting Atomic Reporters. Thank you for accepting this invitation and the kindness of KAS for putting this on. And I, I hope we can continue to work together in the future. Please take care, everybody. There's still a pandemic out there. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>